Well, amen. Great is the Lord our God. Let's all stand to our feet. Welcome to First Baptist Spireville. We're so glad you're here to worship the Lord with us today. We want to lift our voices, our hearts, all that we are in praise and thanksgiving to God. Let's bless the Lord, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Sing this. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yes. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, sing it with us, church. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, see, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take. is worthy today. Sing this. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We'll lift that up. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. We praise you. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered amazing grace. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Well, we're glad you're here. And it's a special day. We've got D-Now Weekend culminating to today. Can we hear it for student ministry? Yeah. Amen. We've got some of student ministry up here leading worship with us today. But what we want to do is show you a video of a recap from this weekend. So turn your attention to the screens.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, students. <laughs> so many sleepy voices. I'm so glad that you are able to join us in worship service today. My name is Anna, and it's a very special Sunday for y'all to be here. If you are a guest, we are so excited that you are here in the seats in front of you. There should be a connect card if you could just fill that out and drop it in the boxes by the doors. We would love to connect with you and keep uh, just just welcome you to our church and get you connected into a connect group and reach out. Also on that card, there is a prayer request on the back. If you have any prayer needs, please write it down. We go through every prayer request as a church every week, and we would love nothing more than to join you and serve you in praying for you. This weekend was amazing. It was obviously our D-Now weekend. We had over 210 students, volunteers, and host homes participating in this weekend. We enjoyed times of worship. On Saturday, as you can tell, we went all over the Memphis area serving our neighbors um, and serving just our church community. And we spent time in worship and fellowship in small groups. And we are so excited about our theme, which was kingdom holiness. We talked about the holiness of God and how he is holy and what we can do to pursue holiness in our own lives. And it was an amazing time of celebration. And we are excited to see how the Lord continues to work in our student ministry. Another thing that is also very exciting is we're celebrating two anniversaries today. We are celebrating Nathan and Lynn Overcast. They are celebrating 54 years of marriage and they should be in service with us today. We are also celebrating Norris and Diane Roberts who are celebrating 57 years of marriage. We're gonna keep the celebrations going and we have a few baptisms today. Good morning, church family. We are here today to celebrate a lot of things. One of the things we always enjoy celebrating is when somebody passes from death to life, receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. This is Allie James. This is her dad, Jimmy, Maggie, the mom and the little brother are in the wings up here. And this family is celebrating the fact that their daughter has placed her faith and trust in Jesus. So, Allie James, it's my privilege to ask you today, what is your relationship with Jesus? He is my Lord and Savior. He's your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, Allie James, based upon your profession of faith, it's your dad, my joy, to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. God bless you. Church, I'm so excited to be here this morning with Cyrus Babry, and this is his dad, John. This past summer, John and Catherine had the privilege of leading Cyrus to Christ. Uh, Cyrus is a new believer. He's accepted Jesus as Lord of his life, and now he's come to be baptized, to follow in that obedient step. Uh, exciting news, John is an ordained pastor. He's pastored up in Michigan, and they're now down here living with us uh, in the Carville area. Uh, so John has the privilege of baptizing Cyrus this morning. Yes, and Cyrus, I'm so excited about your decision to follow Christ. And as you know, baptism is a public declaration that you're following Jesus. And because of that, I'm going to ask you, who is Jesus Christ to you? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, based on your profession of faith, it is my great joy to baptize you, my son, as my brother in the faith, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Well, hallelujah for what we're seeing here today. The Lord is moving and working. Let's all stand. We want to continue to worship the Lord God. Let's sing this all together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a 
today that the battle belongs to the Lord amen church he is faithful and good and true I love the words in that last song right that we can look to the Lord that we can trust him that he is always with us he never forsakes us you know oftentimes we can come here on Sunday mornings and I feel like sometimes we can be so busy with all of the wonderful things happening that we don't always pause to give thanks to God for his goodness so here for just this moment, would you just in your heart think about God's faithfulness and his goodness to you? And just with an attitude of praise and worship, just in your heart, just thank God for his goodness to you. Maybe it's a little thing that happened this last week. Or maybe the Lord has shown himself faithful in some major way in your life. Or maybe you can relate to the words of that last song that say, 
when all we see is the battle, he sees the victory. Thank him for his goodness here today, church. In Exodus 34, 6, we see these words. The Lord Yahweh, he is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That is our God. His love, his faithfulness is steadfast and everlasting. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Let's remind each other of his faithfulness. Sing this church, every voice. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, we praise you, God. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the good day. Let me go. You have led me through the fire and in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived yes. in the goodness. He's running after, he's running after me. Yes, Lord. Your goodness is running after, he's running after me. Your goodness is running after, he's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out. 
First Chronicles 16, beginning in verse 8, says, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders. Boast in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be joyful. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Let's seek him right now. Father, we do come and we do praise you because you are the Lord, the creator, the sustainer, our redeemer. And Lord, before we can make your deeds known to other people, Lord, we come today to recall your deeds. Lord, how you have worked in the past, especially through Jesus, through the gospel, through his perfect life, his death and his resurrection. Lord, we come to remember and Lord, to praise him. And Lord, we ask that you empower us and enable us today with the gospel so that we can share it with others. Lord, we have come to sing to you and you alone because you deserve it. Lord, your name is holy. Your name is above all other names. And Lord, we want to seek you today in worship, not begrudgingly, but joyfully. Lord, and we do come to ask for your strength, strength to live each and every day in the power of the Holy Spirit, strength to make your name known, strength to live a life that brings you honor and glory. And Lord, there are those who need your strength because they need healing, they need comfort. And we pray for them right now. We lift up David Anderson and Catherine Hardier who are in the hospital, we pray for their healing. And Lord, we lift up Joyce Groom, Steve Edwards, Tommy Bramlett, Beryl Cobb and Norm Marsh who are in rehab. Lord, strengthen them and return them home. Return them uh, back to their homes, Lord, so they can continue to glorify you. We lift up Glenn Dixon, Lord, as he draws each day closer to you. We pray for his wife and his family that you can give them strength. And Lord, we especially lift up the Henson family who lost Audrey this week. We pray, Lord, that you would bring them comfort and peace. But Lord, today, we ask that you work in our lives. Take your word, use it for your glory, but especially in the life of someone who may be at enmity with you, who, are, who is far off. We pray, Lord, that they would hear the gospel and repent and place their faith in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This weekend, we have a men's conference. It's uh, Friday and Saturday. Tomorrow is the last day to sign up. And we have two speakers, Matt Hess and Tim Jackson. We have a video from Tim Jackson right now. He's, he's my teammate on the basketball court, believe it or not. And he's my teammate here in the ministry. And he is going to bless you. You do not want to miss it. So here's a word from Tim Jackson. Men of Call You a First Baptist Church, listen, I am Tim Jackson. I am super excited to have an opportunity to share with you guys again this year in your men's conference as we talk about armoring up for Christ, being warriors for Christ. I hope to see you on Friday, February the 23rd and Saturday, February the 24th. It's going to be an awesome time in the Lord and I hope to see you there. Now you you can't see that in that picture because he's sitting down, but the reason Sam is glad that he's a teammate is because Tim's about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, can jump out of a gym and can shoot the lights out. So Tim Jackson is a godly man. You know Matt Hess. Matt Hess is a godly man. They're going to be speaking on spiritual warfare in the life of a man. So I want to encourage all you men and all you young men to sign up and be a part of the men's conference, which begins Friday night and will end uh, Saturday around lunch. So thank you for being here today. I want to begin today by, you see the title of the message, The Ultimate Endorsement. But what does it mean to endorse something or someone? Well, it means to give support to someone or something. If I say I endorse this, it means that I think this is a good thing and you should too. For instance, when someone endorses something on a commercial, it means go buy this. You need this. 
We see that all the time, don't we? We're just inundated with endorsements and commercials on TV and movies. Recently, we had the Super Bowl. Over 160,000 people registered to vote in the 36th USA Today Ad Meter Competition. And it ranks the Super Bowl commercials from best to last. The 2024 winner was State Farm's Like a Good Neighbor. Star I tried my best with that. <laughs> Starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, and it had a score of 6.68. The next highest rating was the Dunkin' Donuts commercial featuring Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Now, understand this. When, when these guys signed on to, to endorse these products, I want you to understand that they were paid handsomely for that endorsement. So they were paid handsomely, but they had uh, tremendous responsibilities as a result of that endorsement and that money that they made. For instance, you've, you've read lately of great athletes and movie stars who had tremendous endorsement deals, and they lost those endorsement deals because they didn't live up to the ethical part that they were to play in, in, in representing that product. Uh, we know Tiger Woods lost millions of dollars. Ja Morant has lost millions of dollars because of that. Well, today I want to speak to you not about endorsing State Farm or Dunkin' Donuts. I want to talk to you about the ultimate endor endorsement. If you will, take your Bible, turn to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, and the context that we're dropping into in this chapter is exhilarating. It seems like all of Israel was caught up in a messianic firestorm that was being fanned by the bold, spirit-anointed preaching of John the Baptist who was calling people to repent and to get ready to meet the Messiah. In our text today, five men, give a bold, stark endorsement of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not, they didn't get paid a dime for that, by the way. Not one single red cent. They're simple, ordinary men who were seeking the truth with all their hearts. Now, the first endorser of Jesus is John the Baptist. Take your Bible, look at John chapter 1, verses 35 and 36. The Bible says again the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now earlier, uh, John the Baptist had announced boldly and loudly to as many people as could hear him when he preached, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But here is just two of his disciples. See, John had some disciples also. And, and they had followed John and they hung on every word that John taught them. And, and here, John the Baptist looks at his two disciples and he said, hey guys, pay attention. That's the Lamb of God. That's the Lamb of God. And what John the Baptist was doing, he was wanted those guys to realize that he was not the Messiah. In fact, he had said that earlier, right? He said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm here to point people to the Messiah. So he told his two disciples, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. It was like John the Baptist was passing them off to Jesus, and he certainly did that. So like a mother eagle pushes her young eaglets out of the nest so they can fly, this mighty man of God wanted his two disciples to quit following him, and he wanted them to know Jesus and to follow Jesus with all their heart. What a powerful endorsement of Jesus John the Baptist gave to him. And then verses 37 to 39, the Bible says the two disciples heard him speak 
And what did they do? The Bible said they followed Jesus. Have you ever wondered what it means to be a disciple? A disciple of Jesus simply means that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these two disciples of John the Baptist became a disciple of Jesus. And they began to follow Jesus. Verse 38, and Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? By the way, that's maybe what he's asking some of you today in this room. You've been trying to figure out who Jesus is. You've been trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. And maybe he's saying in your heart this morning, what, what do you seek? What are you looking for? And these two guys said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Now, that's a strange answer to that question that Jesus asked. Rabbi, where are you staying? I, I think what they, they were saying, we need some more time with you, Jesus. We need to ask you some questions. We need you to speak into our hearts and our lives. And so Jesus said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now the 10th hour in Jewish time is 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So here are these two disciples they're with Jesus at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. They stay with him the rest of the day. I don't know. They may have even spent the night together. I'm not sure. But they've got to understand. They want to know who Jesus is. This is their first exposure to Jesus. They're seeking the truth with all their heart. And then we come to the second endorsement of Jesus in our text. In John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41. The Bible says one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, now don't, don't miss the picture here. You got two disciples of John the Baptist. Here's one, here's the other. One of those disciples is named in the text. It is Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. And the Bible says this. One of the two who heard him speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. Now the word found there, the verb found implies that someone has been diligently searching for something and then joyously discovers it. Matthew 13, Jesus told this little parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. With the joy of a man who had just discovered the treasure of a lifetime, Andrew comes to his brother Simon and he says to him, we found him. We found him, the one we've been searching for all of our lives, the one we've been waiting for. We have found the Messiah. Now, the word Messiah is a Hebrew term that means anointed. In fact, in the Old Testament, you will discover that prophets, priests, and kings were anointed by God for their task. And, and when the, the Jews understood the idea of an anointed king, obviously their minds would go back to King David, right? But one greater than King David is here in this scene in the Bible today, and it is King Jesus. And he is the anointed one. But Jews expected this anointed king to deliver them from Roman oppression and to set up the kingdom of God at that moment right there in Israel with Jerusalem as its capital. But that's not the, the, the king that Jesus was, right? Jesus didn't come to free them from Roman oppression. He didn't come to set up the kingdom of God at that particular time. There was something he had to do first, wasn't it? You see, the, the, the cross had to come before the crown. Jesus had to go to the cross of Calvary 
and die as the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. In John 1, the Bible says, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, Simon's interview with Jesus changed his life forever. You see, Jesus did something then that he's still doing today. He didn't look at the problems that Peter had in his life or the the handicaps that Peter had in his life. Jesus looked at Peter and he spoke toward his potential for the kingdom of God. He said, I want you to know, no longer are you going to be Simon. I'm renaming you. I'm renaming you. You're going to be Cephas or Peter. Now, his new name means rock. Peter would become a strong, dependable leader in the church that Jesus would give birth to after his death, burial, and resurrection. Later on, Peter himself will give a ringing endorsement of Jesus when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What an endorsement of Jesus Peter would give later. Donald Gray Barnhouse has written of this passage, and he made this statement. Even before the Lord Jesus told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men, Andrew witnessed to his brother and landed the big fisherman, Simon Peter. Many who think they can be used in far fields have never begun where the Lord Jesus meant for them to begin, and that's right at home, right at home with your own family. Listen, the thing about Andrew in the Gospel of John, anytime you see Andrew in this Gospel, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. He brought Simon to Jesus, his brother. He brought a little lad with five loaves and two two or three fishes to Jesus. He brought Greeks who were wanting to talk to Jesus, brought those Greeks to Jesus. He's bringing people to Jesus. By the way, that's what we're supposed to do, right? We're to bring people to Jesus. Now, have you ever wondered? We talked about these two disciples of John the Baptist. One of them, we know his name, Andrew. But who is this other disciple? He's not named in the text. But I think I know his name. I think his name is John the Apostle. You see, most conservative scholars believe that this unnamed disciple is John the Apostle. But why, you say, well, John never mentions his name in this entire gospel. He never mentions his name. He's always uh, deflecting to other people. And, and, but John's fingerprint, John the Apostle's fingerprint are all over every page of this gospel. And I believe that the, the third guy who endorsed Jesus in our text today, even though it's not said In black and white, I believe the third guy was John the Apostle. Now, think about this. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, we find John the Apostle's ringing endorsement of Jesus. He said, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. By the way, if all the things that Jesus said and had done and all the signs that Jesus had done were tried to 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 be forced into a book there's not enough pages in 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 the entire world to allow that kind of large book to be written it's just impossible but what the apostles did they took uh, special moments with jesus special things that jesus did miracles and teaching and they recorded what the holy spirit led them to record for our benefit today. See, what we're studying today is something that the Holy Spirit inspired John the Apostle to record in this gospel so I'd have something to preach today. And so you could understand how important it is to make sure that you don't waste your life. Young people, don't waste your life. Spend your life endorsing the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible goes on to say here in verse 31 of John 20, but these have been written 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Well, what an endorsement. John the apostle says, I want you to understand that this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. And then he goes on to say, he's the son of God. He's the son of God. He's the only one who can give true spiritual life to you. So the question is, will you endorse Jesus as the Christ, the son of God in a culture that would make fun of you in a culture that would reject you and maybe even cancel you. John would say to us today, endorsing Jesus by believing in him will result in true spiritual life. That's what you're searching for, right? Let me tell you, the things of this world will never meet the deep needs of your heart ever. But I can tell you one who can, his name is Jesus and he can give you abundant life and eternal life. There's a fourth guy here that endorses Jesus in our text. And his name is Philip. Philip endorses Jesus. Look at verses 43 to 46. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee. And he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Be my disciple, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. They, they, they grew up in the same town. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, now, just think, think about what he's about to say. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Now, by the way, that, that's a great answer when somebody challenges your belief. You say, well, I don't know what to say, Pastor. You, you just say, that. well, come and see. Let, let, let's look at this together. Let me study this. Let's look at it together in the Scripture. That's exactly what Philip did. So John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. Andrew understood that Jesus was the Messiah. Philip called Jesus the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. Now think about that. Philip says to Nathaniel, I want you to understand this guy Jesus that I'm following, he is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. Now understand that during that day, they only had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. And Philip says to him, Jesus, this guy I'm following, this guy I want you to meet, this guy is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. What an endorsement that is. Now there's a lesson in this for us. Even when we're we're, we're not aware of it. Jesus is fully aware of everything that's going on in our lives. Listen to this. In John 5, 39, Jesus would later say in this same gospel, he would say, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. That's Jesus' own witness. He said, I want you to understand the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi testifies about me. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. What an amazing fact that is. Now, now Nathaniel was rather skeptical, okay? But Jesus appreciated one thing about Nathaniel. He appreciated the fact that he just told it like it was. He didn't have any kind of hidden agenda or anything. So Nathaniel endorsed Jesus also in, in verse 47 and 48, the Bible said, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? They had never met before. Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. 
And the omniscience of Jesus, the fact that Jesus knew everything about Nathaniel and he had never met him before, struck Nathaniel like a sledgehammer. Suddenly this Jewish man realized he couldn't hide anything from Jesus. Jesus knew what he was thinking. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew the motives of his heart. Jesus knew everything about him. By the way, there's a lesson there for all of us. We might think we can hide things from Jesus. We might think, well, I, I can do this and nobody will ever know it. Or I can have this illicit motive in my heart and nobody will ever know it. I tell you, friend, Jesus will know it. He knows everything about you, teenager. He knows what you do on Friday night. He knows what you do on Saturday night. He knows what you do at school. He knows everything about you. And that goes not only for students, it goes for adults in this room also and those watching by live stream. He knows everything about us. I, I tell you, that is comforting in, in one respect, but it's frightening in another respect, isn't it? He knows us. Even when we are not aware of it, Jesus is fully aware of everything that's happening in our lives. He knows what we're thinking, what the motives are. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. Andrew understood that Jesus was the Messiah. John declared that Jesus was the Son of God. Philip called Jesus the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. Now, Nathaniel endorses Jesus also. I want you to see what Nathaniel said about Jesus. Verse 49, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Wow. From being skeptical to calling Jesus the Son of God, the King of Israel, is a gigantic leap in that man's faith. And I love Jesus, the response of Jesus to Nathaniel's endorsement. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. In other words, here's what Jesus says to Nathaniel. He said, Nate, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now, that's a colloquial expression here. But Jesus said, look, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, this term, Son of Man, was one of Jesus' favorite expressions of himself. It, it, it spoke of his deity and it spoke of his humanity at the same time. This term is used 83 times in the Gospels and at least 13 times in the Gospel of John. You, he, Jesus used a veiled reference to something that happened in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, you remember when Jacob was running away from Esau? Remember that? Esau had threatened to murder him, to kill him. And so Jacob hightails it out of town, and he's somewhere around Bethel, and he's, uh, he, he's sleepy, so he lays down with a stone for a pillow, and he goes to sleep, and he has a dream. And in that dream, there's a, la there's a ladder from heaven to earth, and God is at the top of that ladder, and angels are descending and ascending on that ladder. And, and so Jesus uses that reference to remind Nathaniel that he is the ladder. Jesus is the ladder. He is the connection point between heaven and earth. There are no other connection points. Jesus will later make this statement. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You see, the only way we could ever go into the presence of God is through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ by putting our faith and trust in him. So today we've examined five ordinary men who endorsed Jesus in the most unusual ways. And they endorsed Jesus in a culture much like ours, a culture that had by and large rejected him. So here's a question that every teenager and every adult and every child has got to answer today. 
You got to answer it. There's no neutral ground here. here. Here's the question. Will you endorse Jesus? Will you endorse him at your school? Will you endorse him in your home? Will you endorse him at your workplace? Will you endorse Jesus? Now, I want to point out some things about endorsing Jesus that are very important. These five people who endorsed Jesus believed in Jesus and committed their lives to him. See, understand this. You can't endorse Jesus today if you don't believe in him. Now, look, the, these actors and these athletes, they can endorse products and never use, a, use them one single time. But that's not true when it comes to our spiritual life and our connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, these five guys believed in Jesus and they committed their lives to him. And I promise you this, if you're going to endorse Jesus, you have got to believe in him. You've got to receive him as your personal savior and Lord. There is no endorsing Jesus without faith. The second thing I want you to notice is simply this. These guys, the, 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 these five guys never walked a red carpet with throngs of people ooing and awing over them. Never. By the way, that's not going to happen for you. If you endorse Jesus in your life as your Savior and your Lord, and you commit your life to him and you're serious about following him, I promise you the world is not going to pat you on the back the world, the, Jesus said this. He said, the world will hate you. The world will hate you. We say, Pastor, why in the world should I ever endorse Jesus as my Savior and Lord if I'm going to get this backlash from the culture? Why? Well, understand this. These guys, these five guys that we looked at today they weren't paid a red cent. Yet the be benefits they received were out of this world. You see, they received eternal life. They received forgiveness of sins. They received an inheritance that would never be defiled, that would never pass away. And that's what you can expect if you endorse Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. He'll forgive your sin. He will change your heart. He'll give you the gift of eternal and abundant life. He will bless you in this life and the next life. Oh, is it worth it? Oh, I think it's worth it. Absolutely, I think it's worth it a thousand times over to endorse Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Now, let me say something else about these five guys. Are we know that that they, they believed in Jesus we, and committed their lives to him. They never walked the red carpet with throngs of people ooing and awing over them. They weren't paid a red cent, yet the benefits they received were out of this world. And listen to this, they weren't perfect. These five guys were not perfect. They were not perfect. But they sought to live holy lives in honor of the Lord they endorsed. Now, I, I, I want every young per, person to listen to. Stand, stand up just a minute. All, all young people, stand up. I want to see your, your hoodie. Let's see. It says, he is holy. Now, you know, there's another part. Go ahead and be seated. There's another part to what that statement is. Because he is holy, what? We're to be holy, right? If we say we're endorsing Jesus, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, then he expects us to live holy lives. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, you must seek to be holy in all your behavior. Now, you've been talking about that all weekend, but now's the time to put it into action. Now's the time when you walk into school on Tuesday and you go to school and you, you're endorsing Jesus that you live a holy life before those other students, that you live a holy life before your brothers and sisters, before your family at home, and before your friends. Now, let me say one final thing about these five men. They followed Jesus for the rest of their lives. 
And they were passionate about bringing people to the Lord. You know what the Bible says of us? The Bible says if you really endorse Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, that you are an ambassador of Christ. You're an ambassador for Christ. That means you are going to go out into, in, into the, the circles of your influence and you are to tell people about Jesus and bring people to Jesus. Just like Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. Just like Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. To share the gospel with those who need to hear the best news in all the world, right? I listen, I, I read a story about a famous agnostic, Aldous Huxley. And Aldous Huxley was at a, at, at a party. And it, 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 was a, it was a party, and there were a lot of believers in that party. And, and Sunday rolled around, and it was time for those believers to go to church. And many of those believers went to church. But Aldous Huxley picked, picked out a, a plain little gentleman who just radiated the life of Christ. And he said, sir, will you not go to church today and just let me talk to you about Jesus? I need to understand about Jesus. And, and here's what the man said. He was just a plain spoken man. He said, sir, I'm not smart enough to handle what you will throw at me. And here's what Aldous Huxley said. He said, I'm not here to argue. He said, I just want to know the truth about Jesus. And this plain spoken man took Aldous Huxley and he began to share with him what Jesus meant to him. See, that's what witnessing is. It's telling people what Jesus means to you. And the, at the end, Aldous Huxley was in tears. And he looked at this plain-spoken Christian gentleman. And he said this. He said, sir, with tears flowing down his cheeks, he said, sir, I would give my right hand to believe like you believe. As far as I know, Aldous Huxley went into eternity without a relationship with Jesus. But I'll tell you what this believer did. This believer did exactly what somebody who endorses Jesus should do. He told somebody else what Jesus meant to him, how he changed his life. And that's what all of us must do. Listen, in this group today, I guarantee you, there are, there, there are family members who are lost they're without Christ. Maybe a husband, a daughter, a son, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, an acquaintance, and they're lost. They're lost. And I want to invite you today. I want to invite you to come to this altar in just a moment. And I want to invite you to bring their name before the throne of God's grace and pray with passion that they would come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. I encourage you to do that. And then ask God to open a door for you to share the gospel with them. But maybe you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm a believer. Well, listen, I encourage you, don't walk out of this room today without settling that in your heart. If you're not a believer in Jesus, you can't endorse him. And I'll tell you, friend, nothing is more important than putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. So you come to one of our staff. Now, I'm going to ask our worship team to come, our staff to come. And I want to encourage you today. You do exactly what the Holy Spirit leads you to do today and it come, when it comes to this message that you've heard. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that this wonderful text reveals five ordinary people who endorsed the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I praise you that these five people were true to you until the day they drew their last breath. 
It wasn't some passing uh, thing in their lives. They, they, they followed you for the rest of their lives. And Lord, I'm praying today that the Spirit of God would move in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls today. And I'm praying that people will come to faith in Christ. I'm praying that believers will get serious about following Jesus and sharing Jesus with others. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you offer us far more than anybody or anything on this, on this earth could ever offer us, Lord. Be glorified in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand in worship and you come as God leads you. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day, Please, every head bowed, every eye closed. Well, I, I don't know all that the Holy Spirit may be doing in your hearts today. But I know what he did in my heart. As I studied this text, and I saw how these, these endorsers of Jesus saw what they called him. John called him the Lamb of God. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God. Andrew called him the Messiah. John the Apostle called him the Son of God. Philip called Jesus the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. And Nathaniel called him the Son of God, the King of Israel. Oh my goodness. That's the Jesus that we're presenting to the world today. That's the only Jesus that's available. Listen, there are a lot of knockoffs of Jesus out here in the world today, but I'm, there's only one true Jesus. And this is who he is. And I encourage you to endorse him with all your heart. Okay? Hey, thank you for being here today. I want to remind you, if you're a guest with us today, that we have our Discover CFBC dinner this coming Tuesday night at 615. 615 Tuesday night. And if you haven't signed up and you'd like to come, we'd love for you to come and be a part of our Discover CFBC dinner. We'll feed you a great dinner. We'll talk about what the church believes, how we operate. You can ask any question you want to ask. And you can even join the church on Tuesday night, okay? And then I want to remind men, sign up for the men's conference. You're missing it. If you miss Tim Jackson and you miss Matt Hess, 
you're missing an opportunity for a real blessing. So thank you for being here today. Sam, come and close us in prayer. On the men's conference, it's not too late to invite. This morning, I invited 15 people, not from our church, who need to be a part of this. So I encourage you to do that as well. Let's pray. Father, we come and we praise you. Lord, thank you that you sent your son, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the one who fulfilled all your promises and your prophecies. Lord, thank you for those who were willing to endorse them by giving their lives to share your word. So Lord, as we go, may we give you our time and talents this week and live in a way that is an endorsement of who you are in our life so our neighbors will know that Jesus is the Son of God. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.